Okay, so for the benefit of, of those that will be following along on uh, YouTube, I think uh, this is the data science uh, learning uh, community. And today we are we are look, going through the integrated statistical learning uh, book, which today I will, I will be presenting chapter exercise of chapter nine of the book, uh, which is about uh, support vector uh, machine. Uh, the, like the first uh, questions uh, in which they did ask in the book, he said, uh, this uh, problem involved uh, hyperplane in two dimensions. So they were like saying that we should sketch the hyperplane uh, where one plus three X one minus X two is equals to what's uh, zero, where we have to indicate the set of points for which one plus three X one minus X two greater than zero, as well as the set of points for which one plus three X one minus X two uh, is less than uh, zero. So in this, uh, they would make use of uh, ggplot2. So they specify the X limit, which goes from minus 10 uh, to, 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 to 10. They also specify the Y limit, which goes from minus 30 to also 30. Then for the points, they were using the expand dot uh, grid function, where they specify the values for the X, uh, one, they also specify the values for uh, the X2. So uh, uh, they use uh, ggplot2 uh, to do run uh, the visualization, but in the in the aesthetics, so they just say color is equals to one plus three, three times X1 minus X2 greater than zero. So where this, uh, where this condition holds true, we can see, it is being shown here in the region where we have true. So we can see that all these values uh, uh, for the, uh, we can see, uh, we can see the our our hyperplane. So we can see the hyperplane where we show that we have just two classes. We have the, the, the pink and also uh, the, uh, the 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 other classes. So so for the second part, they were uh they were looking at on the same plot that we should sketch the the hyperplane where minus two plus x one plus two x two is equals to what zero. We should also indicate the set of point for which minus two plus x one plus two x two greater than zero, as well as the set of point for which minus two plus x1 plus two x2 is less than zero. So this also they make use of ggplot. So they were still making use uh, of the same plot. Uh, they were just adding a new a new layer where they have to use jump AB line to fit the AB line where they specified the intercept is equals to one and the slope is equals to what minus one over two. Then they add the jump points, which is going to plot the points. Then the aesthetics color, where they said interaction of where we have one plus three times x one minus x two greater than zero, minus and minus two plus x one plus two x two uh, greater than zero. Then the size of the point is set uh, to zero point five. So they were also using uh, the scale color discrete because we are dealing with the discrete value. So here we can see that here we have false, false. Here we have true, one true, and also false. We also, here we have false and true. So here we can see the conditions, uh, the, the whole true in this part. So we can see how we were able to add a new hyperplane to further classify this into give us uh, like uh, to give us four classes. So we have this class, we have this class where all values were true. We also have another class. We also have another uh, class here. Yeah. So for the second question, so they were saying, uh, we have seen that in P is equals to two, uh, two dimension, a linear decision boundary takes uh, it takes the form of uh, uh, of beta zero plus beta one x one 
plus beta 2 x2, which is equals to zero, we now investigate a non a nonlinear uh, decision uh, boundary. So here we have to sketch, we have to sketch the curve. We have to sketch uh, this curve, which is uh, one plus x1 square plus two minus uh, two x2 square equals to four. So here we also make use uh, of the expand uh, dot grid function. So uh, we have the points, we have the data where we are going to use to plot the points. So here we are using uh, our ggplot2 functions. So we pass in uh, the data, then we specify the aesthetic mapping. But in this case, we are now using uh, geom contour, which is going to draw uh, the circle where we say the breaks is zero and the color of the contour uh, is going to be black. So this is uh, the final output from uh, the sketch because for, for the curve in which we're, we were able uh, to sketch. So, so we can see that on, on our sketch, but what that is also say we should indicate the set of points for which this condition is O's and also as well as the set of points for which this other uh, conditions O. So for us to achieve that, we need to, we need to add a new function for color where we specify uh, the conditions. So where this greater than zero, then the size is uh, is equals to uh, 0 0.1. So, so we now see our equation. So we have one plus x1 raised to the power of two plus two minus x2 raised to the power of two minus four greater than zero. So where this condition all true, we can see we can see them here. Then where this condition all falls, so so we can see them here. So we can see how we have been able uh, to uh, to specify our condition based on the on the on the sketch in which we did earlier on. So they also say that suppose that a classifier assigns an observation to the blue class if uh, one plus uh, x one square plus two minus x2 square greater than four. And to the red class, otherwise to what class is the observation? So here we have the points, okay? So we have if else, one plus the points, dollar sign x1. So so which, so where this, if we can see that uh, the first uh, classification is gonna be blue. So the second class is gonna be red. The third class is going to be blue, and the last class uh, was also uh, blue. So we have been able to see that because they were asking that uh, where, which towards class, which this observation falls. So we can see that we now have these are the classes. The first is going to be blue, the next red, and the next blue, and the last is going to also be blue. Then D, they say we should argue that while the decision boundary in C is not linear in terms of x1 and x2. It is linear in terms of x1, x1 square, x2, and x2 uh, square. So the, the decision boundary is giving us this, so which we can expand to give us uh, this other uh, equation. So we can expand uh, that decision boundary to give us a, this equation, which is linear in terms of x1, X, uh, x1 square, x2, and x2 all squared. Okay. So I don't know. Are there any questions before I proceed to question uh, three? No, I think we're good. Okay, thank you. So the third part of uh, with the third question, we said here, we explore the maximum margin classifier on a toy data set. So this was just a data set where we have seven observation. This is the values for X1. These are the values for X2. And these are, this is the response where we have red, red, and also here we have blue, blue, and blue. Okay, so we need to sketch uh, that observation. We need to sketch. So this is the data. Okay, this is the data. 
So we have our plots, so we need to use our plots uh, to sketch uh, the observation. So here we have seen this is our red, this is our red, we have four red, we also have uh, three blue. So this is our sketch uh, of that observation when we plot it. So the sketch B, sketch, they say we should sketch the optimal separating hyperplane and provide the equation for this hyperplane of the form of 9.1. So here we are using a new library, okay? Then we fit, we are using the SVM, which is a support a vector machine. <laughs> then we have as dot factor, we convert the response uh, to factor, okay? Explained by period, then every other predictor. So data is data, then the kernel is linear, then the cost is 10 and the scale is equals to false. So here we need to extract the beta zero, beta one and beta two. So for us to do that, we have to specify the beta, which is fit of rho. Then we have to drop T fit of the coefficient as dot matrix. Then we have data fit, then index one uh, column one to two. So we now to get the names beta. So we rename them to beta zero, beta one, and beta two. So we now do our plot where we have slope is equals to minus beta index two all over beta index three line type is two, which is going to give us a dotted line. So, so when we visualize uh, this uh, so we can see we have our x one here, we have our x two here, we, and we have our separating uh, uh, hyperplane. So this is our hyperplane, which shows that we have two class in which, and we can see that we have been able to separate this into the various classes. So here we have our blue, and here we have our red. So here in C, they say we should describe uh, the classification rule for the maximum margin, maximum margin classifier. It should be something along the lines of classify to red if beta zero plus beta one x one plus beta two x two greater than zero and classify to blue. Otherwise, provide the values for beta zero, beta one, and beta two. So here we have to classify to red if beta zero plus beta one x one plus beta two x two is greater than zero and blue otherwise where beta zero is equals to one, beta one is equals to minus two and beta two is equals to two. So how do we go about that? So, so uh, on the sketch, we indicate the margin for the maxima uh, margin hyperplane. So how do we indicate uh, the margin? So we are using Joom ribbon. So we specify the static mapping. We put X, Y minimum is Y minimum, Y maximum uh, is Y max. So this is the data, which is a data frame. So when we plot uh, this, so when we plot this, we can see our ribbon here. This is our hyperplane, okay? Then this is our values, which is what we can say this is our, support uh, vectors, those are our, our support uh, vectors. So now they now said we should indicate the support vector for the maxima margin classifier. So the, for us to do that, uh, we use uh, just our jump points, passing the data with size of the points should be equals to four. So here we can see that our support vector, here we have one, here we have another one, uh, We here, we have another support vector here. But I can also say we have additional one here, but let's, uh, we have three, we have been able to identify uh, three support vectors. So the support vectors from uh, shown above, Agree, there is another support vector since four points exactly touch the margin because we also have another point here. We have one, two, three, and also there is another point here, which also touch uh, the margin. So they now said 
we should argue that a slight movement of a seventh observation will not affect the maximal margin hyperplane. The, that is a slight movement of the seven observation will not, not affect. So here, they just, they did a subset for the seven observation. They said the size is still four, but the color of that seventh observation is purple. So we want to see if a slight movement of this seven observation, does it affect? We can see that the slight movement, it does not affect the maxima margin hyperplane because we can see the here, yeah, we can see that our classifications are is still stand. It does not have any effect. So we can see that the seven point is shown in the popular board it is not so it is not a support vector and is not close to the margin. So the small changes in x1, x2 values will not affect the current uh, calculated margin. It does not affect our maxima margin hyper plane. Okay, so the G, they say we should sketch a hyperplane that is not the, the optimal separating hyperplane and provide the equation for this, uh, for this hyperplane. So here we have a non-optimal hyperplane that still separates the blue and red points will be one that touches the red points that at X1 is equals two and X2 is equals to two and the blue point at X1 is equals to four and X2 is equals to three. And this gives a line Y is equals to X over two plus one or when beta zero is equals to minus one and beta one is equals to minus one over two and beta two is equals to one. So here we have P plus Jomebi line intercept is one slope is 0 0.5 and line type is two, then the color is equals to red. So we can see that line here, okay? So on that line, it run in between this blue, uh, this uh, red and also this uh, blue. So this is our initial, initial marginal marginal hyper plane. So when we draw that line, that line just cut through here, we can see it's going in between, it's going, okay? It's just going in between uh, the red and also uh, the blue. Okay, so the la the next one in H, they say we should draw an additional observation on the plot so that the two classes are no longer separable by the hyperplane. So when we draw an additional observation, okay? And this additional observation is this observation, okay? So when we added this observation, we can see that is not possible for us to separate it into the two different class because we have a problem here because we are now having a misclassification problem. So it's very difficult here. In this case, when we added this point, we can see we, we could not classify them into uh, the two class. So we are just through, now we are about to go uh, to the applied question. I don't know if uh, there are any comments uh, or further contribution. Okay, I should proceed. Thank you. So that for the first question, the fourth question here, they say we should generate a simulated two class data set with 100 observation and two futures in which there is a visible but non-linear separation between the two classes. And we, also, we should also show that in this setting, a support vector machine with a polynomial kernel with degree greater than one or a radial kernel will outperform a support vector classifier on the training data. Which techniques perform best on the test data, make plots and report training and test error rates in order to back up your assertion. So here we have our random seed. We have our data. Okay, we have our score. Okay. We have our data dollar sign class. We want to specify our class of I when score is greater than zero, it should be red, otherwise it should be blue. Okay. So, so we so we run our plots, okay, where we have data aesthetics. So we specify our aesthetics, then color is equals to class. So the class is that when the score is greater than zero, it's red, otherwise 
it is blue. So when we look at this, so we can see where scores are greater than zero, we can see that we have two classes. So the red shows where the scores are greater than zero, while the blue shows where the score is uh, less uh, than zero. So those are the two class. So now we now split them into training and test data sets. So we now fit our model, which is a list. This is for radial, okay? This is for the polynomial, oh, okay? This is for the linear uh, model. So we now, we now uh, get the error, which is a function of model and data. Then we output, which is stable. Then we run predict on the model and data. Data is by the class. Then this the outputs. Then where we have the plots fits of the data. So when we plot it, so we now have this uh, this. So which is our SVM classification plot. So here we have the blue. So here we have uh, the red. So it shows that we have two classes. Remember, we are still dealing with uh, the classification problem. So so we also have plots of the fit. The second object, so we have to pass in the data. So we, the second object is this. So we have here, we have in the blue, we also have in the blue here, then we have in uh, the red here. So when we index the third item in that plot, so we have uh, uh, the SVM classification plots. So now we now use the S apply, we pass in the fitted objects, then the error, then the data is data for the training set. So for we can see that radial, the error we have 0 0.04. For polynomial, we have 0 0.30. Then for linear, we have 0 0.10. So when we look at uh, the test sets, okay, when we extract the test sets, the radial is still doing better here. We have 0 0.06 uh, polynomial and also for the linear. So here we, in this case, the radial kernel perform best, followed by the linear kernel with the second degree polynomial performing worst. The ordering of this model is the same for both the training and the test data sets. So we can see that the radial for both the training and the test data sets is doing uh, a better job for us. So question five, uh, they said uh, we have seen that we can fit an SVM with a nonlinear kernel in order to perform classification using a nonlinear decision boundary. So we will, we will now see that we can also obtain a nonlinear decision boundary by performing logistic uh, regression using nonlinear transformation of the future. So here we are generate we generate a data set with n is equals to 500 and p is equals to two, such that the observation belongs to two classes with a quadratic decision uh, boundary between them. For instance, uh, we, can, we can do this as follows. Here, we have the value of our x1, our value of x2, our response, okay? Then we set our random, uh, our random seed, then, then this is the training uh, data sets. So the, the response, so we convert it to a factor as dot numeric, train dollar sign, one raised to power of uh, two, okay? It should be train dollar sign minus train dollar sign, x2 raised to power of two, where it is greater than zero, okay? Where it's greater than zero. So we put everything as train y. So we now plot uh, observation color according to their class uh, labels. Uh, in such a way that x1 on the x-axis and x2 on the y-axis. So when we plot this, so when we plot this, uh, we are going to have these values where we have y, where we have red is where we have zero. And what, uh, uh, here is where we had uh, one. We can see that we have uh, two classes. So these are the first, and these are also the uh, the second class. So we then need to fit a logistic regression model to the data using X1 and X2 as a predictor. So when, when fitting the logistic regression, so we use uh, this 
uh, the family will just specify a uh, binomial because it is uh, a logistic. So then we apply this model to the training data in order to obtain a predicted class level for each training observation. So we plot underscore model, which is a function of fit. Then we say if inherit fit of SVM, then we uh, we use train dollars and P, then we predict on all the fitted object else. Uh, we should else, we should use train dollars and P as a factor predict on the fit that is greater than uh, zero. So when it is greater than zero, it's gonna color it in a different way, otherwise another. So now, so now we now do our plot where we specify that color is equals to P because here, yeah, this is where we got it from. So when we use the plot underscore model for fit uh, one, when we use plot underscore model for our fit one, we now have uh, these outputs. So here we had one. So here we have less value for the red. So now we fit a logistic regression to the to the data using nonlinear functions of x1 and x2 as predictors. So we have x1 square, we have x1, we have x2, we also have log of x2 and so forth. So for the logistic regression, we are using the GLM function where we have the response explained by poly x1, two, this is uh, the quadratic. This is also plus another quadratic function then data is equals to train, then family is uh, binomial, okay? But it's giving us some uh, warning, so we put. So then we now apply this model to the training data in order to obtain a predicted class level for each training observation. So once we apply this, so we just use plot underscore model for the, for the fit two. So we now get, uh, we now have uh, these outputs, which shows that we have uh, two uh, classes just as I got initially. So now we now fit a support vector classifier to the data with X1 and X2 as predictors. Then we obtain a class predictions for each training observation. So we now plot the observations colored according to the predicted class uh, label. So we have fit three SVM, Y tilde X1 plus X2 data is trained then kernel is uh, linear. So we have plot underscore model for the fit three, which, uh, which gave us this. This now shows that we only have, uh, we only have uh, one, one class that fits in this. So the H here said we should fit a SVM using a nonlinear kernel to the data. Then we obtain a class predictions for each training observations. So we plot the observations or colored according to the predicted class label. So here we have SVM, Y tilde X1 plus X2, then data is equals to train, then kernel is equals to polynomial, then we have using degree two. So we have plot underscore model on fits four. So once we do this, we are now obtain this, which still telling us that uh, we, we still have uh, the two classes which are intact. So, so here we can see that when simulating data with a quadratic decision boundary, a logistic model with a quadratic transformation of the variables and an SVM model with a quadratic kernel both produce much better and similar fit than a standard linear method because... Hello? Yep. Okay, I, I was thinking you have a questions or comments. Oh yeah. Um, so the last two questions here are examples where the the actual data relationship is nonlinear. So a more complicated model, maybe a little more high variance, does better. Is that right? Can you repeat yourself again? My network is. Hello? Sure. So the last two questions were examples where the B, B relationship in the data is is not is nonlinear, right? So yeah. 
and so therefore the, the models that are, are nonlinear and maybe a little more high variance do better or are these still high bias models? Uh, if it is not linear, yes, it's still high variance model. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little unclear on whether it's a, still a high bias model, the structure is nonlinear, or is it because it's nonlinear now it's high variance? Yes, 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 yes. And I think that is what they were even trying to draw here that when when simulating data, quadratic decision boundary, a logistic model with quadratic transformations of the variables and an SVM model with quadratic kernel both produce much better and similar fit than a standard uh, linear model. Okay, cool. Okay, so question six, it said at the end of section 9.6.1, it is claimed that in the case of data that is just barely linearly separable, that is a support vector classifier with a small value of cost that misclassifies a couple of training observations may perform better on test data than one with a whoosh value of cost that, that does not misclassify any training observation. So we will now investigate this claim. So first we generate two class data that is P is equals to two in such a way that the classes are just barely linearly separable. So we set our random seed, then data is data frame. We specify X, the class, specify the class. Then we have our data dollars and Y, which is class of red and then R norm 200. So we get our new data, the response, okay, the new the class, okay, then we use row bind on the data and also the new data. So here yeah, we said data, we have our sample, which where the number of rows of data, we need just 200 sample want to pull out 200 sample, then we use that uh, in our visualizations, okay? So here we can see our separate, uh, the, our hyperplane, which we use to split this into, the, uh, into two different classes. So this is the first, these are the second group. We use it to split it into two groups. So now we now compute the cross validation error rate for the support vector classifier with a range of cost values. So, so first of all, we specify the cost. Then we use S apply on the cost function of cost. Then we fit our model. So we can see that we have how many, when we specify the cost, when the cost is around 0 0.01. So we can see we have about, about nine uh, uh, classification for the support vector. So when we look at the cross validation error, okay, here we use the tune on the SVM as the factor class. Then we look at the summary of the outputs. So when we look at the summary of the outputs, you can see the cost is 10. The best per performance was 0 0.005. Then the detailed performance results, where we have cost, we have the error and also uh, the dispersion. So here we have data frame. We say cost is output, dollar sign performance, dollar sign cost, misclassification. Okay, here we have cost and mis misclassification. Then we now generate an appropriate test data. So this is our test data, okay? is a test data of the response. Then we now do the plots. We now run our plots. We just add join points. So we still have uh, our outputs. So I think uh, we, we now had a new uh, point for the test. We can see we can fit model on the training set, but when we now bring in new data, we can see 
how the, the model in which we are fit is going to perform. Well, we can see that uh, when we fit in the new data, which is the test data, we can see we had the model did not do a better job we can, because we can see we can see the test sets. We can see we have classification uh, problem. So here we, we we can look at we can pull out uh, the cost. So we can see the number of supports of a vector that is uh, being associated with the test set. So we can see the cost is just uh, 0 0.01. So we now fit, uh, we can now fit this, uh, we now fit the model. So we can see the cost number of support vectors is 135 for this. So for this, we now have test for the prediction, we made a prediction on the fit and also the test. So we we run this. So when we look at uh, this, uh, it now shows that we have prediction is equals to class. So here we have false. Here we have a uh, true uh, true classification. So so we can see that a large a large cost leads to overfitting as the model finds the perfect linear separation between the red and the blue in the training, in the training data. A lower cost then leads to improved prediction in the test data. So the, we can see that the lower the value of the cost, it, leads, it, it makes the model to do a better predictions on the test data set. So, uh, question seven, they were saying that in this problem, uh, we will use support vector approaches in order to predict whether a given car gets a high or low gas mileage based on the auto data set. So here we create a binary variable that takes on a one for cars with gas mileage above the median and a zero for cars with gas mileage below uh, the median. So we have zero and also one. So here yeah, we are using the auto data set from the ILSLR2 package. So we specify the IMPG, okay? Then we now do our fit. So first of all, we specify the cost, then the results, which is a list then the I gas mileage explained by displacement plus horsepower plus weight. Then we do the hyperparameter tuning. Okay. Then we now get the summary of our of our outputs. So when we get the summary, we can see this is the cost. The best performance is around zero point zero point around ten percent. So so now we repeat B, this time using SVM with a radial polynomial basis scanner with different values of gamma and degree and also cost comment. We should, they say we should comment on our results. So we use tune on the S, SVM F data. Then we now get the summary of, our, of the outputs. So here we can see that the cost is 0 0.1, the degree is one. The best performance is 0 0.10. So we can see that we have the cost here. We have also have the degree and we also have the error. We also have uh, the dispersion. Uh, we also have the dispersion. So here we also do the tuning, tuning on the SVM object. So then we look at uh, the summary. Uh, this is uh, still the summary here. We can see the cost is 1000, that the cost is very large. The best performance is 0 0.08. You can see as the cost increases, the best performance went up. Then we now use the S apply on the result. Then here we have function of X, then X best performance. So we can see the linear, we have around 10%. Uh, the polynomial, around 10%, then also the radial around 0.08%. So we now do the same S apply function for best parameter. This is the cost. This is for polynomial. The cost is 0 0.1, degree is one. 
and also radial, the cost is 30, and also the, the cost is 100 and gamma is 0 0.1. So they now say we should make uh, some plots in B above and C using uh, the plots, the plot functions, okay? So for us to make some plots, so we need to form the table, okay? This is like the confusion, uh, the, confusion the table. So we now run the plots on the results dollars and radial best model, then data is horsepower explained by, uh, horsepower explained by displacement. This is the support vector matching classification plots. So we chose uh, this uh, class, which is for one and this for zero. I mean, also this for, for all where we had uh, one. So it shows that we have just two class. So we, we can see where we have high MPG and also where we had low values for, for the MPG. So we also look at the second plot, uh, which also give us uh, uh, this, which gave us uh, the this output. So for the third, we have in plots, then we extract the result for the radial, then the best model, then the data, then the displacement explained by weight. So we, we have this, so it shows we have also uh, two, uh, it's also, we have two uh, two groups. So uh, in the eighth question, I think they talk about uh, this problem involved the OJ data set, which is part of the ISLR2 uh, package. So they say we should create a training set containing a random sample of 800 observations and a test set containing the remaining uh, observations. So here we set a random seat, specify the training set, and also we specify uh, the test sets. So then we fit the support vector using the SVM function. So we have purchase explained by every other thing. Data is OJ, then we pass in the train data set, then the kernel is linear, then the cost we are using 0 0.01. Then we look at the summary of the fits. So we have SVM uh, kernel, so the cost is 0 0.01. Uh, so we can see that we have the number of support vector is 432. The first set we have 215, the next we have 200 and, 217. So the number of classes, it shows that we have two class, the levels of the class, we have CH and MM. So they now ask us that what are the training and test error rates? So we need to check to know what are the training and the test error rates. So we've, we need to define the functions to get the error. These are the functions, then the error, which is a functions from the model. And then we have to train, then the error of the model, then OJ train, then the test, then we extract the error from the fitted object. So we can see that the train set, we have 0 0.17, while for the test set, we have 0 0.16. So we now use the tune function to select an optimal course. So we need to use the tune function. So we specify, we are now using the tune, okay? Then we now run the tune on the best uh, parameter. So we can see that the optimal uh, cost for year is one. So we now run the summary on the tuned uh, object. So when we run the summary of the tune object, we can see that the optimal cost is one. Then the best uh, performance is 0 0.1775, okay? So we now compute the training and test error rates using this new value for cost. So the error, then we have tuned dollars and best and model. So we can see that the training is this and also the test uh, error rate is this. So we now, they now say we should repeat parts B through each using a support vector machine with a radial kernel. Here we are going to use the default value uh, for gamma. 
So for us to do that, we specify the tune, okay? Then we extract the best uh, parameter. So we can see that the best parameter, the cost is 0 0.4641589. So we extract the error tune from the from best model. So we can see that the train is 15, 0 0.15, while the test is 0 0.16667. So then in G, they say we should repeat part B through E using a support vector machine uh, with a polynomial kernel, set the degree uh, to two. So here we also specify the tuning parameter. Then we extract the best parameters uh, from, from the model. So here we had 4.641589. So we extract the error. So this is a training error rate. So this is also the test error rate. So we can see that overall, which, which approach seems to give the best result on the data. Overall, the radial kernel appears to perform best. Uh, it appears to perform best in our own case. I think, uh, that, I think that is, yep, I think that is all from the exercise. I think it, it, on that last one, it's, I mean, it's close, right? Because the radial, is it the radial that has the, the no, the, the, it's the polynomial one that has the lowest train error. Yes, I think right? this one, one, we have 14, 0 0.14. This one, we have 17, 0 0.17, which is around 17. Uh, percent. Well, so, yeah, so I guess on average, the radial has the lowest error across both, right? Because radial has the, has the lowest. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, it's, got, it's got the second lowest train and the second lowest test. Yes. Yep. So I think uh, next week uh, we'll be looking at... Uh, the next chapter, which is chapter 10, is about uh, deep learning. But if no one sign up, I think I will try. I will try and present. All right. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'll be able to do it. But if I am, I'll, I'll, I'll put a message in the Slack. OK, no problem. I'll try to present so that because on the 13th, I might not be, I, I might be moving so that uh, though the meeting was still old, so that I will not keep uh, the meeting. I think this, uh, someone signed up for that chapter, but it seemed, I do not know if he will still present it, but I will find out. Okay. Uh, the, Chapter no no one has nobody have signed up.